All right, last talk of the day. You all know that there's an after party, right? Can I get some hands up? Yay, after party. Please, don't be more enthusiastic. <laughs> all right, if you don't know, by the way, you can see on your badge where the after party will be. 545 at Metaroma, which is like around the block-ish. You're good, you'll find it. Um, all right, so let's end, top things off with Lucas. Lucas comes from Corinthia, or Canton, south of Austria. It's an area I know very well and I like a lot. Great swimming, great hiking. Um, yeah, Lucas is working at Big Movement and he's gonna tell us a little bit about how failure and evolution changes you as a company. So yep. without further ado, Lucas, take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Well, hello everybody. Hope you enjoyed the Dev Fest so far. This is engineering at Bitmovin, how we failed and evolved. But let's, oh, sorry. It's rather a, a generic title, so what is this talk really about? Well, I won't deliver a message here or make some points or something like that, but rather talk about our backend uh, in general, how we build our microservice architecture, a little bit uh, about front-end, like what problems we had there, and also a little bit about code quality. So there may be new things for you, or you just uh, may know everything I'm going to talk about. There may be interesting things for you, or just random startup bullshit. So to give you a little bit of context, what does Bitmovin actually do? Well, we're building the backbone of video on the internet. We're doing that by building free products, encoding, player, and analytics. Our customers integrate our products into their workflows to enable video on their uh, web page, iOS app, Android app, um, <coughs> smart TVs, basically wherever you can play back video. We are a very uh, developer-focused company, so all the interactions um, with our products happen through APIs, which is important to know when, when <coughs> talking about engineering at Bitmovin. So, <coughs> Let's dive in and let's have a look at our first steps in the backend. Let's have a look at our monolith, the PHP API. Um, <coughs> was mainly developed in 2015 and is a typical early stage startup uh, monolith. It was the platform for encoding and player. Back then we didn't have analytics yet. As you can see, um <coughs> the Development process, the tools we use, the language we use is very rudimentary and um, <clears throat> there is not too much automation going on. We are deploying with Ansible scripts hacked together. We're doing git pull on the production instance um, and also do Chuck Norris deployments. What does that mean? Well, you just log on to the production instance, fire up Vim and just fix the, co fix the code there. Um, we have no unit tests, integration tests, or alike. We just do um, <coughs> some manual testing. To the right, you can see some quotes. They are supposed to be funny. Um, I have no memes or something like that in my presentation, but it should somehow reflect what was going on in our minds uh, back then and throughout the whole presentation. Um, <coughs> so. By the way, we did that all while there was production traffic on our instances, so we had customers uh, use our, our products when we do, did Chuck Norris stuff. Um, <clears throat> let's move on a bit to uh, mid-2016, where we started doing uh, microservices a little bit. As you can see, the tech stack changed a little bit. We're now at Java 8 uh, using Spring Boot. We are already um, <coughs> containerizing our applications with Docker. The deployment changed a little bit, so we're now using Rancher. Coming back to that later, but um, <coughs> it's just a Kubernetes uh, with UI only, and frankly not the best piece of software on earth. Um, we have no API gateway yet, so we're directly accessing the, the services from the front end. So authentication, authorization, and all that uh, <coughs> shit needs to happen in the services. We tried some uh, API gateways, but uh, quite hardly failed, or hard failed with that. We have no central logging, so whenever there is a bug in production that you cannot reproduce you locally, you need to log on to the uh, virtual machines and, and <coughs> check the code there, or log on to the, to the Docker containers. 
in order to see the logs. Um, so you can see there th where this is going towards. And that was a little bit about the <coughs> history of, of our backend. We knew that this wouldn't really scale. Um, we wanted to provide a better platform, a more flexible solution for our customers, and started to build the, the BitMovin video API, which is an API uh, that should solve all the use cases of our customers concerning video now and uh, also in the future. So what do you do first when you're designing a, a complex system that should be flexible, it should be developer focused, so developer experience matters, um, <clears throat> and, and is complex. Well, we started with the REST API, as all the interaction with our products happen through the REST API. The goal here was, again, to design an API that, that solve, solves all video use cases our customers have, now and in the, in, in the future, while being beautifully and conveniently to, you, to uh, work with, because developer experience matters for us. So we started in June 2016 to develop our um, API spec. Um, we, we, we wrote that in API Blueprint, which is a language to define your REST endpoints. As hosting, as rendering solution, we chose API.io, which basically takes that API spec file and turns it into some HTML. We quite quickly ran into problems with that because, as you can see in the bottom right, our API spec file today has around 1.5 megabytes of JSON. And API couldn't really render that in the beginning. Um, it just crashed and failed. And also features of API Blueprint weren't really supported fully by API IO. So we had to pay them a shitload of money um, to keep our API spec up and running. But coming to that uh, later again. So <clears throat> in order to really build then our BitMovin API, we did some evaluations of tools and technologies that we uh, can use to build it. Here you can see the components that we need to build the microservice architecture that we have today. We applied the fail fast principle, so we had a pool of possible solutions and wanted to get rid of them as soon as possible, wanted to break them as fast as possible. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, I'm, I'm starting now with the backend, what the backend looks like um, with the evaluations we did back in 2016 applied. Remember, we didn't re-implement anything here. We really started from scratch. So there was kind of a transition phase going on concerning the mindset of how you implement features because it's very different uh, from uh, the monolith way. Debugging is different, feature estimation is different, and feature implementation is different. We had no experience at all with microservices. We did a lot of learning by doing, so also failed quite a lot. So in order to understand that, I'm showing you a microservice, a bit moving microservice, how it looks like. Well, bunch of Java 8 code, Kotlin coming to that uh, later again, so using Spring Boot, um, a lot of REST endpoints, some messaging listeners, a database, of course, and the whole thing is containerized using Docker. One thing to remember here is that in a microservice architecture, you really have one database per service. And uh, like that doesn't mean that you have multiple SQL clusters or something like that, but really one schema for one service. So let's start with the different parts that really make a microservice architecture. And the first thing that comes to my mind is like, how do we run this thing actually? I mentioned Rancher in the beginning. We weren't really happy with that, or not at all actually, because it was just some UI interface where you could click to deploy something and developers don't really like that. So we looked for a managed solution and quite quickly found Google Kubernetes Engine, which is a really great piece of software. So we have our services running on our Kubernetes cluster. 
and we need some sort of API gateway to in interact with them. In our case, that's Kong. Kong is taking care of all the route mapping, authentication, and stuff like that, so you can really communicate with the services from the um, outside world. As you can see here in the right, we don't really have production and staging or something like that, but take that a little bit further to have uh, more canaries or traffic groups. The internal one, for example, is used by Bitmovers um, in, in their day-to-day -day work to deploy the services after the CI build finishes to test something. So you don't have to have five or six services running locally in order to uh, really test something end-to-end. -end. Problems we've had, well, Kubernetes worked quite nicely, actually. Uh, <coughs> not really big problems. With Kong, though, we had, in the beginning, a lot of memory issues. So Kong was uh, constantly running out of memory, and we had to restart it pretty much every day for half a year or something like that. But eventually, we found out how to use it and how to run it in HA with Cassandra's data store in the backend and stuff like that. So today, it's running quite nicely, but also coming back to that. So <coughs> we have those services running. Um, you can communicate with them from the outside world, but a big topic in a microservice architecture is like the inter-service communication. In a monolith, you just have a function call. In a microservice architecture, it doesn't really work. So there are two ways that I know. Um, HTTP REST calls, well, there's no big magic behind it, just do your HTTP calls. One thing to keep in mind here is uh, error handling, so you need uh, retries in case of network failures, you need to have um, <coughs> some backoffs and stuff like that to, to keep that running. Messaging is a different topic. We didn't have that in the beginning, but quite quickly realized that that could uh, help us a lot in building our microservice architecture. And went with a managed, managed solution first because yeah, we didn't really have the resources to, to host something ourselves. And chose SQS SNS, which is from AWS. But yeah, we aren't also uh, really happy with that. Or it doesn't really make sense, our services are running in GCP. Uh, SNS SQS is running in AWS, so you get some performance issues or uh, bigger delays. The message size limit is also quite interesting. You have 256 kilobytes of uh, data then you, that you can send with SNS SQS, and we exceed that. So um, we looked for something else, evaluated Kafka and that, yeah, that monster, but um, chose then RabbitMQ in the end which, yeah, just works. I think in the um, little bit more than one year, it wasn't down for a minute. So, sorry? Why you Kafka? I don't like Kafka. <laughs> Let's leave questions for the end, please. True. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have service communication. Those can communicate with each other in the cluster, but you quite quickly realize that, well, um, you need to share some entities, some classes, because service A serializes something, so service B deserializes something. And the first thing that maybe comes to your mind is, okay, uh, or that came to our mind was, let's do a client library. What is that? Well, you have two artifacts per service, a client and a, and a service. The client is basically an interface there's just a dependency that you can include in your service, which then communicates via HTTP with the, with the other service. The problem uh, we had with this was uh, versioning hell. So you need to publish something to Artifactory every time you change a small enum or something like that. Um, and really slowed our development process down. So we made the decision to uh, go to shared nothing which sounds un unintuitive, but uh, really worked for us. The thing here is that you copy the code to um, every service that you really need, and uh, you don't really share any code through a dependency. The problem with that is that multi-service features um, get expensive. So, for example, you have some feature that affects every service, 
and you implement it once, but then it needs some update. You do it in one service and forget about all the others or there is just no time. So what we then did is uh, <coughs> we, we started with micro libraries, which are basically very encapsulated and, and self-contained libraries that only serve one purpose. In our case, we, the first macro library, macro, macro library sorry, we did was uh, RabbitMQ client, which is uh, shared through our whole microservice architecture. Something we are moving towards now is a shared kernel, which basically means that you group all the DTOs that somehow fit to, together and put them in, into one uh, library. The, kind of works now is we are somewhat stable in terms of DTOs. In the beginning, we added 20 DTOs a day. Now it's, it's not that many anymore. So you can communicate with your services uh, from the outside and also in the, in the inside of the cluster and implement your features. But well, you need to do some testing. In an environment of really constant and rapid change, Tests really make your system stable. In the beginning, we didn't really do that. We had Postman tests, or tested stuff manually, and yeah, quite quickly realized that this is not uh, really scalable. So we wrote unit, integration, and system tests. Problems we've had with that is um, <clears throat> that when you're under pressure, you tend to write really uh, not the most beautiful code. And uh, ugly code tends to have little abstractions. It was this, uh, the case um, in, in, with us. And that makes testing really hard. As you can imagine, when you have little abstractions, you cannot mock, mock things. And uh, in general, you're, you're slowed down. So today, when you're refactoring or working on an old service, you, you start to refactor first. And then uh, <coughs> write some tests, maybe for the old stuff. And then start with your feature. Another problem is uh, <coughs> testing, where you have integration tests that also affect the, affect the database. Um, in case of Spring Boot, we use H2 as in-memory database for testing, which acts kind of like a big transaction during the test. So you wouldn't catch all those runtime errors like lazy initialization exception. Now you can solve that as having a sidecar pod. Uh, during the CI period with MySQL, so you would, would also catch those things. Um, <clears throat> speaking of CI builds, well, um, we had CI builds taking up to 50 minutes. Not as bad as Oracle DB. I don't know if you've seen that on Hacker News, but uh, Oracle DB takes like 20 to 30 hours to test. Um, but you can reduce that by making your build or CI environment uh, more performant and, and structure your, your tests a little bit smarter. So you write your tests, you deploy something, you test it um, through Postman and it doesn't really work. So you didn't catch something with the tests. Our logging stack is ELK, which is like the de facto standard, I think. Elasticsearch, Logstash and Kibana. And that gets you quite far in debugging when you wrote logging statements in your code. But we take that a little bit further with uh, open tracing and monitoring with Prometheus. Open tracing is a standard that is implemented by applications to uh, enable tracing throughout the application. So <clears throat> you basically see every single step in your application, what, what's, what is happening. And in, in combination with logging, that's really mighty in debugging. So another thing open tracing supports is like showing dependencies between your services and <coughs> that helps you in like figuring out okay where is, is um, a lot of communication happening between services and maybe start to debug bottlenecks. Prometheus is also quite nice so you don't need to monitor something yourself. You uh, have actionable alerts for example, heap space or something like that. So something I missed, um, as you can see in the top right, we write about um, 350 gigabytes of logs each day and scaling an uh, Elasticsearch cluster um, <clears throat> that gets that per day 
when you want to have, I don't know, a month or something like that uh, of logs is also a challenge for itself. Um, I mentioned Kong in the beginning. We have Envoy in front of our Kong, which is basically uh, some HA uh, <coughs> kind of thing that supports open tracing. Here I can show you an example of a trace. In, in this case, it's the create encoding call that doesn't really do any magic. It's just um, inserting a row in a database. So there you can see that the request is hitting the Envoy. Envoy adds some text to the trace, like path, request method, payload size, and stuff like that. And then you can really see how that call propagates through your whole microservice architecture. In this case, it only hits one service. And in the very end, you can even see the, the database statement that is generated by um, your ORM. So when something goes wrong and you see, okay, a database statement takes 500 milliseconds or something like that, there is probably something wrong with your code. As we're speaking of the database, um, <clears throat> let's have a look at uh, our database stuff, well, we have very resource and uh, in entities intensive workflows in our API. There is no real encoding going on in it, but um, just like rather inserting UUID strings, numbers, and, and that stuff. So we don't really store blobs or anything like that. Nevertheless, the database is really key to our workflows. When it's down, uh, our API pretty much becomes unusable. So we went with a managed SQL solution, Cloud SQL, but unfortunately we are uh, not happy at all with it. It has maintenance windows that somehow uh, seem random, and when there is really a maintenance, the failover database doesn't really take over, so it's like, okay, down. That's why we are currently evaluating alternatives. Uh, Google Cloud Spanner would be one. Problem with that is, that you cannot do a bin lock migration uh, as you would do with a MySQL uh, <coughs> server migration. This would, by the way, also enable to have multi or geo-replicated Kubernetes clusters in the end. So today, another topic, today you don't really write SQL anymore, you use some ORM. In our case, we use Hibernate, which is like pretty much the, the choice with, with Spring Boot. And it's like super convenient, you're so productive with an, an, uh, an ORM, but when it doesn't work, it really breaks your neck. In our case, we had really bad queries that, like in, for example, the table per class instead of join thing, where you have an inheritance, and then Hibernate creates one table for each implemented class, and when you then want to do a list call, for example, over those entities, it does a union over all uh, tables. And when you then have a few million rows in each table, it takes like 10 seconds for the list call to execute. A funny thing is also DDL auto update or create. We had one instance where uh, <coughs> this was forgotten to set to validate and uh, one database, uh, remember it's like just affecting one microservice was wiped uh, completely in production, um, <clears throat> which comes out of the convenience that an ORM gives you and maybe a little bit stupidity, but yeah. <laughs> um, migrations, we use Flyway for that. Um, what is that? Basically, you have the SQL alter, create and update statements in your uh, repository per service to create the database that is needed for uh, your microservice in order to run. It does versioning and stuff like that. You can do rollbacks with it and <coughs> it's also quite nice to, to use and pretty much required in our case. So that's it about the different parts we run through. Next is um, the future of our microservices, namely Kotlin. Um, coming to the verbosity um, compared to Java in, in a minute. But in our case, we, we saw that Kotlin uh, could really help us in increasing uh, developer productivity and um, <coughs> having a more modern language with string uh, templates and stuff like that, lambdas. So 
what we do here is like taking the incremental approach. We start new services with Kotlin and uh, integrate it then to existing services when we have the confi confidence because if you really need to de debug something in production and you don't know the language that you use, that's really a problem. We also don't use Gradle, for now at least, because if your um, package uh, yeah, fucks up, you have a problem also. So <clears throat> we've got the backend, we've got the services, database, logging, whatever. We've got the REST API. Our users can really do curl calls and postman calls and stuff like that, but that's not really how they use it um, because not everybody wants to write an HTTP wrapper themselves. So we provide seven REST API wrappers to our customers in the major languages like Python, Go, JavaScript, Java, and um, <coughs> Alex. In comparison to other companies, uh, we have some problem here. Other companies may have like 50, 60, 100 REST cores. We have close to 800 REST cores. So you need to maintain big code bases. Then it there needs to be an API client maintainer because you don't want a Java guy to write a Python wrapper, for example. And you get feature mismatches, example mismatches between those clients because, well, a customer uh, requests a feature in, in client Java, but uh, we don't even really have the time to implement that. So it's then missing in all the other clients. Um, <clears throat> so we don't really want to continue to do that and are moving towards open API. You may have heard of Swagger. The killer feature here is API client generation. So you write your open API spec, which is basically the same as API Blueprint, just a, a different um, <coughs> spec. And click a button and then get the Java client, get a TypeScript client, get whatever you want basically, which reduces the workload and uh, removes all the uh, <coughs> maintaining of those clients from our engineering department. Not everything is sunflowers here though. Um, there are features missing from API Blueprint, so we had to fork the OpenAPI generator, or else it didn't really work for us. There were like um, <coughs> Java clients generated that were like uh, didn't compile, so we had to fix some stuff there. Also, Spring Fox, which would enable us to only write our REST uh, controllers and generate the Open API spec out of those REST controllers, and then generate the API clients from the from the open API spec. That Spring Fox is unfortunately a little bit outdated, doesn't support open API version three, so uh, we cannot really use it. But that's kind of the, the future where we are moving towards in the next few months. So <clears throat> we have our backend. Our customers can integrate the great Bitmovin API, can uh, <coughs> enable their workflows and stuff like that but they don't see any statistics, they have no monitoring, they cannot even sign up for an account, so we need a front-end. Well, <clears throat> remember the PHP monolith? In that kind of time, we used AngularJS for the UI client of the PHP API, but it wasn't really a great fit for us. We had special use cases where you have to bend Angular to your needs, and that's really not nice. So we started to use React, also Redux, of course, for the new Bitmovin API platform. Did some test projects, uh, failed hard. Uh, those projects were a mess. But eventually we figured out um, and got the hang of it. Some problems we experienced with, the, uh, <coughs> with React Redux was Redux state design and usage, coming to that also in a minute. We, of course, didn't build abstractions, so we tightly coupled to external libraries, which were also not really the, the greatest ones. We had no types from the backend as uh, we, we started out in ES6. So you would get runtime exceptions because you, uh, you, you um <coughs> didn't realize that the property is not always there um, and can also come back as undefined from the API. Folder structure, big topic in React. 
Um, basically, the community says, do whatever you want, but chances are quite high that you don't choose the ideal folder structure uh, on your first try. So <coughs> accessibility, not a big topic for us. Um, we were backend developers working on the front end in, in the beginning, and uh, like, yeah, we had no idea what accessibility even means. So um, <coughs> we are also moving towards uh, making uh, accessibility great again in our, in our front end applications. So this JavaScript topic. Well, um, <coughs> as I said, year six in the beginning, but doesn't really get you far. In our case, we uh, decided to introduce Flow because TypeScript wasn't really ready back then. But quite quickly, we realized that it should be rather called slow. Um, there's restricted IntelliSense, um, not a very big type community, so there are not very uh, <coughs> there is not very much uh, types available, and it's basically dying. Uh, Facebook isn't really supporting it. Uh, it's my opinion um, because it's rather hopping on the on the ReasonML bus. So we moved one big application to TypeScript. All others were then already implemented in TypeScript as we knew, like, yeah, we don't want to use Flow anymore. That was quite OK, that migration. Uh, we got quite far with regexes, but sometimes the syntax is quite different. So there you can see in the uh, bottom left the TypeScript pull request merge um, for, one, for our biggest application. And yeah, TypeScript, just the best thing that happened to JavaScript, in my opinion. Mentioned Redux. Um, <coughs> well, at the time we started with React, you were basically, or you weren't told any different that you uh, should use Redux for your state management. And we realized that, okay, that's maybe not the best fit, but we were already deep into the Redux uh, world. We have a lot of async interactions in our dashboard, meaning that you have a lot of boilerplate code because of all the events, actions, and, and reducers that you have to define. And in general, uh, you, you get a much bigger application that you actually want for the, the use case you're solving. You need to use side effects with Redux Saga um, or Thunk or something like that. Compared to Mobix, which we tried out a few months ago, um, <coughs> we really like Mobix. It uses observers instead of that um, fiber, the, the flux architecture, sorry, meaning that you don't really have boilerplate code. Um, <coughs> it supports classes in your state. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though that there is no real global state object that you can access from everywhere. So you have to build something yourself. There is Mobix state read, but we didn't use that in the end. So another, that's it, front and back end. Another big topic for us is code quality. We have a very high standard of code quality at Bitmovin, but that wasn't always the case. Um, in the beginning, we didn't even use Git flow, but eventually moved to having pull requests and Git flow in 2016. Why do we do pull requests? Well, to catch bugs earlier, to share business knowledge, to, to share uh, like code knowledge or uh, if, if a junior guy reviews a code from um, a senior guy, he learns much more than when you're being reviewed. So <coughs> that's a really, was a really big step in, in our engineering organization. We also do pull request reviews in some uh, teams during the sprint meetings. So uh, even share the knowledge further. We use Sonar Cube throughout the whole organization. So every code that is written at Bitmovin is um, <coughs> monitored by Sonar Cube. With Sonar Cube, you get uh, very valuable insights. There is one example of a medium sized application in our backend. You get, like, okay, um, how much dupli duplicated code do I have in my uh, application? What's the coverage? What's the technical debt looking like? And, and stuff like that. Um, <coughs> Unfortunately, I have no metrics about this, so I cannot tell you, okay, it increased uh, productivity by 50% or something like that. But um, 
in general was a very good thing for our engineering organization. Java versus Kotlin in code reviews, well, if you know DTOs and uh, you, you develop Spring Boot, you know that a lot of your pull request is basically just boilerplate code because um, you have a lot of properties in your DTOs and then you have setter scatters all the way, which bloats your pull request. In our case, that is one reason for moving to Kotlin, but um, <coughs> not the main reason. So Kotlin should imp or improves that by having data classes, for example. Okay. Um, I don't know how are we in the time? 25? Okay. So I would, I have a slide now for questions, if there are some. Um, if there are no, I can move forward to player. <laughs> so any questions about? Okay. So how many different databases do you have? Because you said you have for each service a database. Yeah, a lot. Don't know the exact. Ah, sorry, yeah, I have to repeat the question. How many databases do we have? Because I said that uh, we have for each microservice a database. Well, do you know that? Is this for MongoDB? Maybe? Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Which database are you using? Like MySQL. So it's a managed SQL. Managed SQL. Yeah, by MongoDB. No. Not MongoDB. And how do you, yeah. how do you Well, that's uh, not what you do in a microservice architecture. So um, there are use cases where you need that, but for that you build an, uh, another microservice that joins the data in its own database. So you would subscribe for, um, <coughs> to the messages for both services, for example, and then combine the data there. No, um, no, no, it's generated um, and then we split it. Basically, we, we split after the second level. So we have like um, <coughs> the first level is the product, encoding player analytics. Second level is the subcategory of the, of the product. For encoding, it would be encodings, inputs, outputs, stuff like that. So it's it split at this level and then we display it just in a, in a React application with a Swagger UI. Does that? Do you have multiple Yes, yes. We have one file that is generated, but after that we split it into. No, it's, it's not generated from the Java code as SpringFox doesn't support OpenAPI version 3. So it's really written by hand. We migrated from um, API Blueprint to OpenAPI, to the OpenAPI specification. So you merge that and then you split it again? Or? Yes, yes. Uh, kind of weird workflow, but we do it like that right now. As I said, it's not yet in production. We're still working on it, but um, uh, expecting to release that in the next months. Taking we can take it offline, I guess. Yeah. Uh, how do you manage your security in your in your hmm? How do you manage your security in your security? Good question. Um, <coughs> well, I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, so when you implement your code, you take care not to make mistakes that affect security. We have an API API key based access a system to our API, so our customers get an API key, and with that they can access uh, their resources on um, our system, basically. But we have external um, <coughs> companies that work together with us uh, in, in finding, uh, in doing pen testing and stuff like that. Yeah. I have none, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, not, not a Kotlin expert myself, um, but really like it. Okay. So that's everything I can say. Sorry, maybe you have something? No. We didn't have a guideline for that yet. 
Yeah. Yeah, we, we're just starting with it. We're starting new microservices and um, are exploring the language. Say it like that. They don't. No, no, they don't. Um, <coughs> we provide encoding, play and analytics, but no storage. You have your files on your S3 bucket, GCS bucket, or wherever, um, and define the path to that bucket um, during the encoding creation. We then download it from that storage and then push it to um, the storage again. That's it. We have CDN push and stuff like that, so you directly push it to Akamai, um, <coughs> but the files itself just stay in our um, cloud solution when they're encoded. We also have on-premise solutions, air-gapped solutions, where the file doesn't even um, <coughs> leave your infrastructure. Okay. 31. 10 minutes? Okay. So, oh, fuck. <laughs> no, didn't fail. Well, can talk a little bit about the player. Well, I'm talking about the web-based player here. Um, only have one quote to the right, um, which is basically a wrapper around the HTML5 video element. That sounds quite simple, but isn't really, if you keep in mind that we have to support back to IE9. Um, and want to provide a unified API that works or behaves the same on every platform. So, <coughs> We had issues with browser inconsistencies a lot because yeah, uh, it just behaves differently on uh, platforms even um, when there are specs that define how something should behave. But Safari and those kind of browsers don't really manage to do that. New browser features are also very interesting. Basically to stay ahead of competition, we try to implement new browser features uh, in experimental or beta stage, uh, basically as soon as possible. Um, <coughs> and it's an interesting challenge because you have to read a lot of uh, specs, you have to do a lot of trial and error because there are no stack overflow questions um, about those kind of things. Um, usually you then answer them uh, yourself. Um, <coughs> testing. Uh, testing a web player. Very interesting topic. In the beginning, we used Selenium, maybe familiar to some of you, but as we need to support uh, beta and experimental browsers where that doesn't really work, we had to really write something by our, uh, by our own, a hand rolled testing framework, which runs really only in the browser. We also support platforms where there is like no web driver, um, <coughs> like smart TVs and stuff like that, so it's not a real browser where we also need to test our player um, and, and make sure we have no regression errors and errors during the implementation. Web player. Another topic, yes, the player has a backend. Um, <coughs> what it does is basically it checks licenses. Very stupid, very simple. Gets a request from the front end, from the front end, like the player. Am I, allowed to, uh, am I allowed to play on this domain? Yes or no? Um, <coughs> we wrote that beginning of 2015 in Java 7 using App Engine. App Engine, if you don't know it, that's like a, a, yeah, a, an environment where you just push your uh, <coughs> Java file and then it auto scales um, to the amount of requests that, that come in. We used BigQuery in the backend um, to store like impressions and stuff like that. And that became really expensive as fuck. So we decided, okay, we want to do that ourselves and build a backend our own. We, we used Go for that because, yeah, it's a high throughput service, um, has some thousand requests per second and the migration of that was quite interesting, so we had to migrate something from, okay, this is managed, works, 
um, worked for the last three years to, okay, this is all on, all on our own. Um, we used the Google Auto Scaling Group to uh, spin up new uh, <coughs> instances of the Go front end, which, yeah, uh, so, sounds kind of weird, but it's like that. Um, and had some Nginx cluster in front of the uh <coughs> new Go backend and the old Java 7 app engine backend. And then could easily shift the traffic between those. We had to roll back a few times because yeah, we found out, okay, something is not working. Um, and during that period, like, uh, there the <coughs> was some nerfs killed. Another funny story about the backend because I wrote that old thing, the 2K17 bug. Basically, what we had there is the old PHP API um, I mentioned in the very beginning set hmm? five minutes, okay, um, set a valid end date to the license. And whoever that implemented back then said, okay, yeah. How long are we doing the startup? Let's set it to 1st of January in 2017. <laughs> um, nobody really knew about that uh, on the 1st. And we got then customers complaining, okay, our players don't play anymore. And um, I was in Vienna and I woke up because like, I was the only one that, that could uh, fix that in, in the back end. And I woke up not sober. Um, and had 20 missed calls and then needed to uh, just like comment out that, that code that checked the license uh, validation and then did a, a hard push basically. So that Maven App Engine update minus D skip tests happened also quite a lot of times. Um, okay, now it's really it. Um, I hope you learned something new, pretty sure. Um, please let us know if there is like some topic that you're very interested in. I know like this presentation, you could do a presentation uh, about uh, every slide, I guess, but I hope I could deliver some uh, like some experiences we had in, in the last two and a half years. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. I think we got time for one question. Anybody feeling brave? Really? When I tried that presentation, it was like, took way longer. <laughs> um, okay, well, don't go anywhere yet because I still got a few words to say to you. First off, let's give another round of applause to Lucas. And yes, your presentation was good enough so you get a small gift Thank you. from us. <laughs> Google. <laughs> All right. So bear with me, folks.